welcome to another episode of the Paint and Fight Bed podcast. I am thrilled to welcome my brother to the stage, Jason Maiden. Jason, welcome. What's going on? What's going on? It's great to be with you. I, we were just talking about how we just get to have a fun conversation in public, which is pretty fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for the chance to uh, dive in. We're going to do something a little bit different today, folks. We're going to talk about where Jason's at right now. And uh, well, maybe Jason, why don't you start? Give folks a sense for where are you right now? What's the decision you're trying to navigate right now? And then I want to kind of put a pin in that and then go back in time. And let's help folks understand how you've gotten to this point. And we're just going to have a conversation amongst brothers here. So maybe tell us a little bit about where you're at right now. Yep. And, and then we'll go backwards. Yeah. So, so where I am right now is a choice between continuing on the path of adventure that is entrepreneurship or starting the path of entrepreneurship within a large corporation. Both of them have positive upsides, obviously with careers and, and opportunities, but the real decision that I'm making is how do I actually stay in control of my time? Cause that's the most important thing for me at this stage in my life is not giving time to things that don't yield continuity and continuous return. Um, and max value. So not only monetarily, but like the relationships I build, the knowledge that I gain, um, the network that I'm now a part of, the things that I'm able to learn, the, the, the strengths that I'm able to develop. So I'm at an inflection point. Um, and it's an interesting, interesting inflection point, but I feel tremendously blessed to even have the presence of options. A lot of people don't even have an option. And, and, and I have, you know, a few of them and I'm working through which ones are aligned mostly with what I'm being called to do and then what I think I believe um, I would enjoy doing. Yeah. So, so just to quickly recap, you're at a point where you've got to make kind of an inflection point decision about the next call it five years of your career. Yeah. And I think we titled this session career transitions with, for high performers for a reason, right? You're in, in, and hopefully now folks get a sense for of oh, the career transition that's that's before Jason, which is an, as you said, it's an incredible privilege, and it's a real it's a real inflection point, as you said, because there's trade offs. And yeah. before we dive into those trade offs, let's talk about the high performer piece for a second. Let's let's talk about how you arrived at this moment, because um, some folks may know your background, many probably don't. Um, yeah. Can you just trace a little bit of your career journey? And I may just pepper or interrupt you with questions along the way. Fair warning. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say career started <clears throat> at seven years old when I was in a hospital sick with what could have been a term <clears throat> called septicemia, which is a severe blood infection. Um, it was at that moment that I discovered that there was a character named Dr. Lucius Fox in Batman 307, the guy who created gadgets mm. for Batman. Mm. And seeing a person that looked like me that was analytical and creative, was clearly in control, um, resembled my father, his characteristics. Like I just became enamored with this idea that, you know, I wasn't limited in terms of what possibilities that I could dream of, right? Because I saw Lucius creating the gadgets for one of my favorite heroes. And I'm like, well, if this guy can do that, then I could do the same thing for a hero that's in real life, which is Michael Jordan. Okay, okay, but pause, pause, pause. Yeah. How'd you get this comic book? Did somebody give it to you while you're in the hospital? Or like, how, how, did, they, how, did, how did Lucius enter your life? Yeah, so it was crazy. So my dad, when he, he came home from the military and he was going to school on a GI bill at Chicago state university. And on the weekends he would play pickup basketball for money. And after we would watch him play and we would hoop also, we would go home and watch the old Adam West Batman. Um, and I didn't know Batman was a comic book character. I just saw it as a television show. So right. when I was sick, they had this room full of donated books and toys that were part of the children's war. And so like highlights, magazines, Lincoln logs, and there was a Batman, yeah, Batman comic book. And I, I remember looking at it and being like, man, this is, what is this? This is crazy. This is Batman. And so I had no clue that picking up 307, that was the first time Lucius Fox ever showed up in the storyline. So it was serendipitous for me to gravitate towards that one and pick that up. Cause he wasn't on the cover. Like I bought a copy of it and you know, when I became an adult, there was yeah. no indicator that Lucius was involved. So it was meant for me to find that story and to find him. I just got chills, bro. That's so cool. Okay, so so and talk for a second about because you said, okay, my hero Batman, but then my hero Michael Jordan. How did you make the leap? Was it because your dad was a hooper or, or you're in Chicago? Obviously, the Bulls era, dynasty era, right? So it doesn't yeah. take too much of an imagination stretch to get there. But how did you go from 
Lucius is is gearing up Batman. I want to gear up MJ. Yeah, I mean, Michael, for a lot of us, you know, um, as much as, you know, we had access to him through television and proximity, a lot of us could never afford to go to the game. It's kind of like the Warriors now, right? Like, you don't really see a lot of real Warriors fans at at the stadium because they can't afford it. It's people who look at it as an activity. It was the same with the Bulls back then, right? Like, the real fans, a lot of times, were middle-class, lower-middle-class people who couldn't get access to the tickets. And if they did, they normally came through, like, the YMCA or some type of work event, and it was nosebleed. So we never really got a chance to see him up close and personal. So my my perception of Michael Jordan is that he was enigmatic. He would drive through the city in a Ferrari wearing trench coats. You know, people would have reports of seeing him at night playing basketball. Like, like I saw him play pickup basketball more than I saw him play organized basketball. He's a legit superhero in Chicago. Yeah, like, yeah. Not yeah. even from on the court, but, like, even his off-court persona. Yeah, it was wild, man. Like, you didn't really know. There was always a Michael Jordan sighting. Like, oh, he was here at this park playing, or he was here at this school, or he was here. And so I just kind of looked at that as modern mythology mm-hmm. and was like, wow, you know what? If he is the archetype of a hero – then I could be the archetype of a healer because a hero needs a healer as a mm-hmm. companion. That's how they continue to do what they do. And I've, I've, I've always seen myself as a person that's being deployed by God, not employed by man. So I know my gifts are not my own. And even as a kid, I understood, like, if I'm able to survive, I'm able to make it, then I would dedicate my life for using creativity and service to others. And I did that. So that's okay. That's okay. okay. Hang on. You just dropped so many nuggets there. Like, I don't even know. I, I, I can't grab them fast enough. <laughs> Let's put a pin in deployed by God versus employed by man because I want to come back to that. But real quick, you're seven. You're in the hospital bed. You encounter Lucius Fox. You, in your brain, you think Michael Jordan. And then you think, I want to use my, cre- if I ever get out of this bed, I want to use my creative gifts. What happened? Yeah. So, um, was in the hospital for several months. Um, thankfully, you know, they pulled me back from the grips of death. I, I had an extremely high temperature. I was, I was fading in and out of consciousness. And I had a chance to experience what I'll tell what I say is I had a chance to experience life beyond the veil of reality. Like a seven, I saw beyond what we call life. Wow. And it, it, it changed me. Like it changed my, my relationship with time and it changed my relationship with what I think is possible for me. Cause awesome. as how do you mean? Well, you realize that this is this is a continuum. Like we look at life as a linear progression, right? We go through these stages of evolution and maturation and there's a conclusion. At seven, I saw that there was no conclusion. It was just a transference of energy. So energy never dies. Energy is just transferred to another state. And seeing that energy transference, I'm like, well, what is the what is the contribution to the zeitgeist that I could potentially, you know, be known for and at seven it wasn't i didn't have the sophistication or the vocabulary but i, I had the urgency i had no, the- at seven you weren't saying what's the transference to the zeitgeist <laughs> i don't believe that i i, I think you were <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know like according to my teachers man i definitely had a lot of words to say to them um and it was it was the age too where i got out of the hospital and i went back into second grade and it was it was right after that that my teacher told my parents i was broken because I, I have, you know, I'm neurodivergent. At the time, that wasn't a term. It was, if you're a black kid in the inner city and you have a different style of learning, then they put you in special education. So her immediate response is, something's wrong with Jason. He's broken. Put him in special ed. But my parents were like, this is awkward because does he finish his work on time? Yep. Is it correct? Yes. Okay. So what's the issue? Well, he seems to be, you know, bored in class. He moves and talks a lot. My parents are like, well, that means that he's not interested in what you're teaching him. It's probably too easy. Have you have you challenged him? Wow. Right. And so my dad, because he was in school in college, he would take me to college with him as a seven year old, eight year old, obviously to be close to his son who had just got out of hospital. But I was learning physics. I was learning industrial engineering. I was learning calculus. I was learning drafting at seven. And I thought it was normal. Of course, you were thinking of transference to the zeitgeist. I mean, this makes perfect sense. It's all coming together for me. Yeah, yeah. So it's wild because I didn't. My, my dad and my mom never told me something was hard or impossible. They just said it just takes more time to understand it. But yeah, read this book about physics, and I'm like, I don't know what this means. He's like, you'll figure it out. And so that was my my way of navigating the world. And I took a liking to math and science, and was really really good at it at an early age. And I think in that instance, in the inner city, people people regress to the mean. They always look at you know, statistically what the outcome could potentially be. And they don't leave room for free will of God. 
and they just say, well, here's your trajectory based on where you live, what you look like and your socioeconomic status. Yeah. But I just, I don't know, for whatever reason, my parents were in a position to advocate for me. <clears throat> so they created an alternative, you know, um, educational path where I went to class, but they sent me with drawing books and sketchbooks and math wow. books that were supplementing what I wasn't getting in elementary school. So, so that teacher said Jason's broken. Did, did that, did your parents, uh, advocacy change the teacher's opinion or did it change your opinion of the teacher's opinion? Um, so <laughs> in, in my books, I wrote, I wrote a chapter about what happened. So I drew this, I knew my teacher consciously was labeling me as, is cognitively dysfunctional. This is, is the terminology she used. Summarize it as saying I'm broken. So I drew a picture with a kid standing on a pedestal with his middle finger up saying F you. Cause I consciously knew like lady, you, you making things up about me. Now I didn't intend for her to see this picture. Mind you a seven, this is me just rebelling on his shirt. There was a little rocket. Cause I really wanted to be um, at that time. I wanted to go to the air force or I either wanted to go to NASA. Like I couldn't decide. I was like, Oh, my brother wants to be an air force pilot. Every kid has that dream of flying. So, you know, you draw rockets and planes. Mm -hmm. It was a combination of the fact that the kid on the pedestal <laughs> had his middle finger up. I don't know why, like where it came from. It, I, that was my way of rebelling against her um, in a rocket. And she thought it was a phallic symbol. And so the quality of the drawing at seven was extremely detailed and impressive. And so she called my mom and sent, sent home a letter like they used to in our backpacks. And I obviously looked at the letter and see what it was to, to brace for, you know, how it would be reprimanded. I had right. to have a how, many, how many spankings you're going to get. Yeah. Like I had to have a strategy. Um, and so I get home, my mom's on the phone with the teacher. She got called before I can get to get to the house. And my mom wasn't upset. It was like she was laughing. And so what happened is the teacher, even though she did not retract what she said about my intelligence, she started to tell my mom, like, your son has a gift. Like, this drawing is phenomenal. Now, the subject matter, the fact he had a middle finger in it, that, hey, that's, you know, but all in all, like, this is for a seven-year-old, you know, like, this is crazy because I had, like, foreshortening perspective foreground middle ground background like i just drew this image of a kid didn't realize and so this is it now had, had, you've, you're out of the hospital at this point yeah, i'm out you of the hospital. sense that you want to use some of your creative gifts did yeah. you know that some of your creative gift was drawing or was that was it the teachers actually know in the backpack that made you go "Ooh, maybe this is part of my lucius fox toolkit yeah well it was because i didn't fit in like I, I'm, I'm a mixed kid i'm neurodivergent i was sick so imagination became my community. It, like my, my thoughts became, you know, my environment because I didn't necessarily fit in with my peers. Like I was interested in things that kids in my neighborhood didn't necessarily consider, you know, cool. And so drawing was a form of escapism. And, you know, it was, it was a form of rebellion because in, in, on a piece of paper, I could be whoever I wanted to be. When I drew something, I can make it what I wanted. I didn't have to subject myself to the confines of my community in my you know, and my opportunities weren't bound by location when I was able to read and draw and create. So I didn't consciously think of it as a skill set. I, I thought of it more of like my companion, like my imagination was my best friend. Um, and I'm grateful that that was the case because I, I'm, I'm really OK as an adult with being, uh, you know, sticking to myself, yeah. which. You know, and we got to keep we got to keep kind of anchoring back to this present decision you have because right yeah. now you're at the inflection point. So I want to just keep yeah. everything in everybody's mind. The reason that we're the reason that we're diving into this is because we want to appreciate this inflection point and hopefully dive into that yeah. as well. But so walk us through MJ, the 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 hero who's in need of a healer. You're yeah. you you started making these drawings. You realize, wow, my imagination is my best friend. Keep keep drawing us along this journey for you. What how does how do you as Lucius Fox evolve. Yeah, so I um, I thought I was supposed to be an engineer. So I started to teach myself, you know, through my dad's books, mechanical and electrical engineering. So I would take apart, you know, gadgets in the house, TVs, radios, whatever was had a mechanism, I would deconstruct it and reconstruct it and make something different. Um, I really fell in love with data from Goonies. I wanted to be just like him. You know, I want to be a Goonie so bad. I thought it was cool. Like they never really showed images of black kids going on adventures. Like it was just always us running from crime or running from violence, never just innocently navigating our neighborhood and discovering things. So I, I, I became more of a kid who fell in love with that, that narrative of discovery and adventure. 
so at 10 years old, I started writing letters. I had saw um, Amara Rashad talk about Air Jordans on, on NBA Inside Stuff. They used to come on on Saturdays yeah. when we still had Saturday morning cartoons. Oh, I remember it. I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm sitting on my couch right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he was like, Nike in Beaverton, Oregon. And at that time, the only thing I knew about Oregon was like Oregon Trail, the game we played in school. So I was like, <laughs> I was like, man, I don't you're like fording the river and shooting your yeah, game. Yeah. They're like, oh, don't get dysentery. I'm like, what the hell is dysentery? <laughs> <laughs> and so I discovered Nike's, you know, address. I wrote letters. Um, this is pre-emailing people. And I just continued on this path of trying my best to stay in front of them. And it was at the age of 14 where my life took a turn. I saw my friend get shot in front of me. And I ended up spending a insane amount of time out going forward at Foot Locker sketching shoes because that gave me safe passage to go home by having that delay in time. And I meant you, know, you would kind of take refuge at Foot Locker and you'd yeah. be drawing because you didn't want to be in a dangerous situation. Yeah, I just didn't want to have to walk home with everyone else. So I, I spent two, three hours after school because practice was in the mornings for football. So after school was just more of my own time. Yeah. And I was a good student, so I didn't really have a lot of homework. I finished it before I went home. So I would sit there and sketch shoes for two or three hours and then walk home once everybody had, you know, dispersed. And I started to meet people from the industry just by just being there, you know, sneaker reps and, and merchants and people bringing in new samples. And so I started to have access to the industry, you know, uh, simply because of just being, like I said, in, in, in proximate to where these conversations were happening. You're like, you've heard of mall rats, so you were a locker rat. I was a locker rat, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was a gym rat and a locker rat. I was working out, training, and drawing sneakers. Like, I was in the art room, in the gym, in the weight room. That was where I spent, like, most of my time. Um, That's great. You know, it's, 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 it was interesting because that moment of discovering that my talent actually had a label and a talent and a value as ascribed to it, gave me confidence that it wasn't just a hobby, that I actually was headed in the right direction. And I had a teacher, Mr. Summers, my junior year. Wait, how did you, how did, wait, come back to Mr. Summers for a second. How did you find out your talent had a label? Well, I found out my talent had a label because of Mr. Summers. Okay. Right, yeah, so so my freshman year, actually, after, after I saw the incident with my friend, Mr. Summers was like, hey, I need you to stay after an airbrush, you know, so he would let us make money by airbrushing our friend's shirts and clothes. That was how I made my money, cutting hair, shoveling snow, cutting grass, airbrushing jackets. And so it was one day we were sitting there and he had his wallet on the desk and it was like full of receipts and money. And I stare at it because I was like apprehensive to walk into the room and be alone with his wallet. And I was like, Mr. Summers, like, yo, what are you doing? Like, do you know where you're at? Do you know who we are? And he was like, what? You're a kid. You're not a criminal. Shut up. Like, get out there and keep drawing. Like, he said it so fluidly. Like, he didn't even hesitate to, like, stop and think of what I was saying to him. He was like, it was absurd for me to consider myself a criminal simply because of where I was at. He was an older white male didn't come from the south side of Chicago, was driving in from Indiana, volunteering his time. And he was like, bro, you're not a criminal. You're a kid. Like, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you tripping? Like, do you know what you can do? Like, look at your talent. Like, you're not a criminal. What's wrong? Don't ever. And like, he was pissed that I thought that he would think I was a criminal. Wow. So that was my first interaction with like realizing like how society plays a devious trick on inner city kids. You didn't. You weren't. You didn't share that same view that he shared until. Like, talk to me about the view you had versus the view that he shared with you. Um, that he gave you. Well, I mean, the reality is, sorry for getting emotional. It just pisses me off that people don't watch what they say to kids. Um, the reality is that I thought I thought that I thought it. I thought that my life was dispensable. Because that's what you're told. You, you know, you're told, like, after second grade, this is the wild part. They did this thing in Chicago public schools. And it's taken me years to heal from this. But they had us sit in a room, all the boys, and they said, look to your left, look to your right. One out of three of you would be dead in jail by the time you age of 25. And I'm, like, eight years old. No. And this was an assembly that was led through by the police department that told us about anti-gang prevention and anti-drugs. But he took all these little boys and set us in a room and said, guarantee one of your friends are going to be dead. And all of us are looking like, are we going to be the one? So at eight years old, 
our life was on a, on a clock. <laughs> it was up against this fictitious mortality or this fictitious expiration date simply because of where we were born. So all of us were making decisions, not for the long-term impact, but for the short-term benefit of saying I was here. And so when you're 14 and you've been told, okay, you're dying at 25, that's 11 years from that moment. Right. So I'm like, well, what do I do with the, with the 11 years I have left? You got to live a whole lifetime. But then you've got this, this idea implanted from the time in the hospital, right? You're seven that this is a continuum anyway. There's transference anyway. How, how did you kind of reconcile those two, the, the talk at 14, yep. saying I've got 11 years left, and then this sense at seven that there's a continuum here and I, 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 I have to be deployed by God? Yeah, it was, it was, honestly, I had no choice. Like, I'm not a quitter. You know what I'm saying? I don't quit. I don't run from a fight. <clears throat> um, never was raised to, to take a step backwards. If I see an injustice or I see something that's wrong, I run towards it. And I knew in my heart that what they were saying about my life was wrong. And I wasn't necessarily trying to prove them wrong. I was just trying to prove God right. Like, all right, you kept me here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so that, that changed a lot of my trajectory because even though that was going on and I had my own, at that time, unaddressed PTSD and anxiety and depression, like I didn't know what it was called. You know, you just kind of felt it. Um, it was this nudge in my spirit to just keep trying, like keep going, like don't like for whatever reason, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't give up on myself. Um, and it was a lot of, a lot of it was reinforced through my friend who, you know, who did the violent act. The other friend survived, thankfully, barely, but thankfully. And I saw him at a gas station years later because my parents eventually took me out of that high school and transferred me to a high school in a, in a better neighborhood my senior year, which sucked because it's like, you go to high school for three years and then boom, senior year, you get pulled out. But it was a matter of safety. My sister was turning, going into freshman year and they didn't want her to deal with anything. Um, and so it was it was at the gas station. I ran into a, the friend who did it and I was pumping gas in my mom's car. She had a Dodge Intrepid at the time. It was like the nicest car we ever had. It was a used vehicle, but it was like so nice to us. And I feel somebody poke me in my back and say, give me a wallet. And I could tell it was him. I heard his voice. And I'm like, I'm like, bro, what are you doing? And we start laughing. He had, it was his finger and stuff. And he was like, look, dude, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to die in Chicago. You're not. Don't come back around here. Like he was that blunt with me. Like, don't come back around. Like, I know this is your neighborhood. I know we're all here. All your friends are here. But Jason, you're different. You're different. And so, and so you've got these, you, you've started establishing some connections by being the, uh, the locker rat, <laughs> the gym rat, locker rat, art rat. You, you hear this input from your friend, get out of this neighborhood. How, what's the, how did you reach escape velocity, so to speak? How, what, was the, what was the trajectory? Man, so senior year, I got to my new high school and I met, the principal and I met my coach. I stopped playing football. I only ran track and field and threw shot put because I was like, man, they were a weaker team. And I was like, I'm not playing for a rival. Um, I, you know, I'm a loyal dude. And I, I was pretty much done with high school. I had, you know, I basically would spend my summers taking classes. So I was done with high school, like 15, 16 years old. So I was just going to school just to work out and like hang out with my friends. I didn't need credits. Um, so my senior year, junior year, I was done. I, I was going to be red shirted and go to college and play football. So I've been basically had to sit out for two, three years. Would have been like a seven year senior because I was so young going to college. It would have been ridiculous. So continued on with high school, get there, meet the principal, meet the coach. They both played in the NFL and they became like, like great mentors in terms of like, yo, you know, you should really think about the talent that you have and where it can take you beyond the field. And during that time period, I was dead set on like, nah, I got to get to, this is the way I'm going to get to college. My parents can't afford it. I'm just using this as a means to an end. I had no desire to go to NFL. I'm like, I'm just good at it. Not, I didn't, wasn't where I wanted to be, but I was good at it. Yeah. And I was hit by a drunk driver and messed up my shoulder. So yeah, my life is like an odyssey. That's how I know, like I'm supposed to do something <laughs> purposeful because I'm like a real life, you know, tail in an Odyssey in the Iliad. Like I'm part of that, like <laughs> Chicago Iliad. Um, and what was, what was interesting was I could have continued to play, but it gave me pause to think about what I wanted the rest of my life to be like. And they found an article 
of a kid because I had always continued sketching shoes like I was doing. And they found an article of this kid who had an internship at Toyota. And it mentioned that he also interned at Nike. And it was during the, the auto show in Chicago when auto shows were still a big deal in the Midwest because of Detroit. Mm -hmm. So the Chicago auto show was was like the preeminent convergence of culture and technology. And, and just and that was my way of seeing the world was through car design. Mm -hmm. So they found an article. They said, look, you need to call Toyota and figure out where this kid went to school. I didn't know about international time zones. So this was early Google. So I was able to track down their headquarters. Because remember, Google at that point was like classifieds. The internet, yeah. they put everything on the internet at that point. Yeah. They, they, the headquarters, the address, the number, the email, like it was all. You just, you just called this guy up at Toyota. Yeah, I just called Toyota in Japan and left a message and said, look, I'm a kid in Chicago. I want to design sneakers for Nike. You had Chi Wei Lee as an intern. Where did he go to school? That was literally the message. That's the voicemail. Please call me back at 312. Yeah, call me back. And they called me back um, on our Sunday, their Monday. And we finally get on a call like a week later. And the guy tells me, hey, how old are you? I tell him my age. He was like, well, here's the deal. The average age of an industrial design student at this point is like 25. Most people get a degree and then come back to go to ID. So here's what I suggest. Go to CCS in Detroit because you have two choices, Art Center in Pasadena, CCS in Detroit, from Chicago. If you fail, it would be an easier drive home than a flight home. And it was just like that blunt. Um, and I was like, all right, cool. That's logical to me. So I drove to Detroit when my parents convinced them to go take me there negotiated my way into the school because it was past the admissions date. I had a portfolio full of illustration and graffiti, but my grades were stellar. So I was able to go in and let them know, like, look, academically, I'm sound. I just I, I didn't I didn't grow up in an artistic family that gave me preparation and training, but I have a work ethic. So I got him well, at this point. You're also you're still sending letters to Nike. I, I'm just I'm still I'm sending letters to Nike. parallel paths in my mind here. So yeah, yeah. I'm still yeah. I'm still sending letters like still calling, still everything like still just trying to figure out how to get there and so i tell them exactly what i you know said like hey i want to design sneakers at nike this is my journey this is what i've done i've been calling since i was 10 writing letters i heard that they just were an internship like that's what i'm here to do and chi Wei went to to nike as an intern and he went here so i want to go here too and they were like well you can get in but you have to double major because if you fail out of id you need a major as your backup so i, I had to minor in graphics uh, excuse me, yeah, minor in graphics and illustration, but major in ID. Um, and ended up, my freshman year, I wasn't at the bottom of the list. I was in the middle. Wasn't great. Wasn't good either. Either That summer between freshman and sophomore year, same thing. Applied to Nike internships, got rejected. But I came home and did a 1,000 sketches a day because Michael Jordan shot a 1,000 jump shots to improve his free throw percentage and his three-point shooting. So I figured drawing is just muscle memory. It's, it's a technique. And you can learn any technique with repetition. So I taught myself how to draw. Wait, I just want to I just want to replay that for folks who may be listening to this at two X later. How yeah. many drawings did you make per day? A thousand. A thousand drawings a day. Yeah. How many hours did that take? The whole day. Like I would I would break it down into like uh, okay, so what is a thousand sketches? That's a hundred sketches per hour, which is <laughs> ten sketches per you know ten minute increment. Like I would. I would break things down into small increments, how MJ broke down scoring points. Some people say, oh, I want to go out and average 45. Mike is like, no, nah, I just need to get eight per quarter, get to the line this amount of time. Like he broke things down incrementally, and I did the same thing. It wasn't a 1,000 sketches per day. It was one sketch per minute. So you're actually it's tracing good. your it, – it's interesting to me, going back to the hospital bed, seven years old, you're, you have this vision of becoming a Lucius Fox to your hero. And you go, how am I going to get there? I'm actually going to look at how he's honed his craft to get. So in order for me to become Lucius, I got to see how Batman became Batman. Is that what I'm hearing? Am I getting that right? Was that yeah. a conscious decision? No, it was a very conscious decision. Very conscious decision. Because the thing about my neurodivergence is that I'm really good at pattern recognition. And I'm really good at finding things that shouldn't connect. I find an intersection of disparate concepts. And so I saw the connection between a jump shot and a sketch. Like the technique of shooting a jump shot, elbow in is the same as shoulder sketching when you're drawing cars and drawing rims. So I, I, I started to find these different ways to turn design into a sport. And so just like Michael would watch, right. I would I would watch documentaries on art. I would I took art history classes and figure drawing because I'm like, all right, 
the, what's the foundational skills of basketball, ball handling and defense? What's the foundational skills of drawing, figure drawing, color theory? So I took everything and juxtaposed it against sport and I built a curriculum for myself because I was up against kids whose parents were pro designers. And my, my dad was a you know ex-military, you know, um, special operator. My mom was a homemaker and dabbled in real estate. Um, and so they didn't I didn't have summer classes and design camp and all that. So you I had to yourself, you basically built it. It sounds like you applied to get an I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm just recapping here. Yeah. You applied to get an internship. You didn't get it. So you said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give myself an internship. Basically. Basically. Yeah. I, I just refused to let myself sit idle. And I looked at everything as, you know, eventually they're going to tell me yes. Like my whole life strategy is to eliminate the way people can tell me no. So I just I de I de risk things by taking the feedback and then immediately developing the skill in the gap. So when people say focus on your strengths, I agree to that. But when I focus on my strengths as a way to improve my weaknesses, then I become dangerous. And that's how that's how athletes are. Right. Athletes can't ignore their weaknesses because that's a vulnerability and a gap in your defense. So as a designer, I said my, my weakness is my knowledge of design as an industry, the history of art and the role it played in my city. And I started to learn, like, wait, I looked around and all these buildings that were called housing projects were designed by Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius. They were designed by people from the Bauhaus who came to Chicago as a result of Nazi Germany. My grandfather was, was one of those people. I found out later in life my grandfather's Ashkenazi Jew, which that's a whole nother story. And the wow. word ghetto was in English. Like when I first heard the word ghetto, I always thought that's where black people live. And then I found out it was Yiddish and it was a description of a Jewish community. And it had nothing to do with black people. And the housing projects were designed for, for them, not for, you know, low income housing. It was it was community housing. It was it was a derivative of a kaput, which is a community in, that you see in Israel. And so I started to see like, wait, they've lied to me about my city and told me that it was violent and destitute. And there was no beauty, but it's an open air architectural museum built by people who migrated from the south in the Great Migration and people who came over from other parts of the other world and people who were already there pre-slavery because the, the myth of all the Africans being here only because of slavery is a myth. Historically, we've seen that they, they were here. And I started to notice that my city was under siege and it was all the art that freed me. Art taught me that my city was beautiful and it taught me about Jean-Baptiste Point de Sable, the Haitian immigrant who founded my city. People don't realize Chicago, third largest city in America, founded by, the only one founded, officially founded by a black man. Manhattan was founded, it was a black settlement, but this is a city founded by a Haitian immigrant that was part French, part African. You know, at that point it was called Saint um, Dominique before it became Haiti. And it was phenomenal because I, I saw I saw myself now differently because I'm like, I'm part of something. I'm part of something. Because when you grow up in the U.S. as a black man, you're nation, you feel nationless because my, my nation is my city. I don't say I'm from America. I say I'm from Chicago hmm. so, because it gives me a sense of identity and belonging. So then when I realized the depth of my city, it gave me this confidence to, to look at it as an open air architectural museum that, that can continuously, I can contribute to that. So that, that's what art unlocked for me was self-worth and value. And I just carry that. So you get done with this summer, thousand yep. sketches a day. That's, I don't know, call it 90,000 sketches or something. How did you, for folks who don't know this, yeah. it did end up, at Nike, how did you? All the rejections. I love your your uh, your statement earlier. My life strategy is about eliminating the ways people say no. How did you eliminate the no's and get to the yes at Nike? Yeah, man. So um, my sophomore year, I got rejected again. So this time, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna fly out there. So I bought my own ticket. I flew out for a weekend and I just walked around campus because I'm like, you know, the story of David and Goliath, right? most people think that David wasn't necessarily prepared and he was just this sheep herder that had no skill. And Goliath was this beast. Goliath was actually slow and sluggish, had to be walked onto the battlefield with two people holding his hand. And the only way that Goliath was able to win is when you ran up on him and you fought him because now he can fight you in close proximity because he couldn't see. And David realized that David was, he was a sniper. The slingshot was a, was a weapon of precision. Right. And he was trained to hit lions running at him at full speed. So Goliath was an inanimate object at that point. He was just a sitting target. So I had to go and stand in front of Goliath and see if it was really scary. If Nike was really that big, if Nike had the ability to control my God given destiny and I got there and I realized it wasn't, it was mortal just men, a bunch of people, That's just all. a bunch of people, just mortal men. And 
that gave me this confidence that I will be here. I've paid for at least a couple tables, all the shoes I brought. <laughs> I was like, man, you know, so I, took, I took a picture of the campus and I went back to my dorm room. I put it on my ceiling. So it was the first thing I saw when I woke up, last thing I saw when I went to sleep. And I continued on that path of just writing letters. I didn't realize I needed to be a junior in college. That was the only thing that no one told me is that you need to be a junior to get an internship at Nike. Okay. So it never came up. So I just thought like, all right, I'm going to keep applying. And, um, and eventually got in touch with the proper recruiter, ended up becoming Nike's first uh, black industrial design intern and Jordan Brand's first design intern. Um, and when I got there, I, I didn't realize I was the first until the end of the summer. And then I told myself I won't be the last. I can't be. So my whole mission at that point became how do I give people access to this 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 thing? Because I've lived my childhood dream. Like I grew up, I said I was going to do it, and I did it. So now I'm like, how do I help as many people as possible climb their first mountain? And that that that's been my mission ever since. Did you get to meet your hero? Yeah, on my first day of my internship, it was so weird. <laughs> hey, okay, well, why was it weird? Why do you say that? Because it was so. At that time, design wasn't necessarily a well-regarded discipline at Nike. We didn't have representation in the C-suite. We didn't have a budget. It was kind of just stuck underneath merchandising. So when you're a design intern in the adrenaline program back then, it was cool, but it was cooler if you were in timing and vision, because that's when Nike was doing the watches, the Triax watch. And then like, so if you're going into footwear, like it's cool, but it wasn't like you were a nerd, right? Like sneaker geeks, like we had <laughs> basically just WordPress sites where we were just going in blogs and just talking about sneakers and trading them, you know, and meeting up with people all around the world. So it was a very niche, nuanced community. So it wasn't as cool as it is now. So I have to give that context. So I get to Nike and they give me a map and they say, figure out where your desk is at. Now, naturally, you would think Jordan brand would be in Jordan's building. It wasn't. It was in the fourth floor of the Jerry Rice building in the back corner of campus. So like the furthest part of campus away from senior leadership. So that tells you at that time, yeah, your proximity to senior leadership says what what value the organization places on you. Yeah, exactly. So they were they were like Michael's getting ready to retire, Kobe's you know potentially going to come over from Adidas, LeBron and Melo are two years away, three years away from coming. Like we don't need this guy; no one's going to care. So it was a very interesting time because Jordan Brand was just a shoe, so it wasn't a full powerhouse like it is today. So I, I finally figure out that it's the Jerry Rice Building. I get to the fourth floor, I'm looking at the map, and we had just got this long speech about no one at Nike wears hard bottom shoes. It's offensive. Like, you don't wear brown shoes here. You wear sneakers. You wear the product. I'm like, all right, cool. Elevated door opens up, and I immediately spot two pairs of beautifully handmade Baluti Italian dress shoes. And I'm like, I knew they were Baluti because Baluti has a very distinct look. And I'm like, who can get away with wearing? Like, who's doing this? And I felt like, oh, man, they're going to get in trouble. When I look up, it's, it's, it's MJ and Larry Miller, the president of Jordan Brand. And instead of me, like, introducing myself, I tried to close the door and pretend like I was on the wrong floor. <laughs> but I pressed the wrong button. It was the one where the doors would open, not close. Right. Because I was so nervous. Like, this is Michael Jordan. I'm standing in front of him, and no one's around. It's just me, him, and Larry. Wow. And, like, and then I, I'm the door is trying to close and he sticks his fingers through and he has these really long fingers and he touches my chest and he's like, man, you know, are you the intern? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm the intern. And I just was mumbling and stumbling over my words. And he's like, well, how did you get here? I was like, well, I took the elevator. He was like, no, how did you get here from Chicago? Like, I know your neighborhood. This is, <laughs> this is the wild part, dude. This is how I know God is real in my life. I don't push my faith on anyone, but I do have to share this. Hmm. So my mom, and my dad were the first ones to integrate a high school on the South side called Finger High School. My mom was on a swim team with this woman named Juanita who became his Michael Jordan's wife. No. In my neighborhood, I had played with his nephews, never even knew that they were related to him. Wow. No clue. So he knew my neighborhood and knew where I came from, knew what I overcame. And I thought he was asking me, how did I get to the fourth floor of the Jerry Rice building? Right, right. He was now, asking he said, how did you get there, Nike from Chicago? Yeah, how did you get from here to there? And it was it was it was that moment where we kind of chuckled and laughed, and you know I realized like man I did it like the dream I had as a as a kid laying in a hospital like I'm really here I really did it so I explained to him the story and you know and he was he was very supportive and and throughout my career has always been supportive because he knows how much it means to me to be a part of that. 
Okay, so so we've now traced you from the hospital bed at seven to the internship, but yeah. now there's kind of called a you know twenty ish year gap or so between yeah. the internship and present day. Yeah. What are what are the highlights that in, like maybe two key highs and two key lows that have taken you from if if we just had to skip a rock across the history here. Yeah. That bring you to this moment. What's yeah. the high that's informing the way you're thinking about, you know, your career transition and what's a low that's informing it? Yeah. Um, the high is my wife and kids. I mean, I've been married now for almost 20 years. We've been together for close to 21 years. Um, that to me is the most important thing I ever do. It's the yeah. most valuable thing I have is my relationship with my wife and children. Um, from a low light perspective, I think it was the revelation that my whole life I felt that I wasn't smart enough and I needed to be grateful for these opportunities. And I finally got to the room at the table with all the quote unquote big dogs and none of them. Were, I mean, I'm be honest with you. I wasn't impressed with their intelligence and their abilities. I was actually quite appalled that wow. these people have been allowed to occupy positions of power, but they're exceptionally mediocre. Wow. There's no competency. There's no leadership. There's no discipline, no accountability. It is really good at not getting fired. Where do, really where do you, can you, I mean, without obviously like, you know, anonymize it as necessary but yeah are there, are there particular moments where you were like wait does no one know what's going on here yeah when i had someone postgraduate school at stanford because in between that i went to grad school um because i knew that i wanted to fulfill the dream of my dad he never got a chance he was raising three kids always wanted his master so i said i'm going to be the person first in my family to pursue that type of degree um i came back and I was having conversations with a few colleagues and I remember them saying, is that a Stanford word? Is that a Stanford word? You, you just, is that a Stanford word? Why do you, you think too highly of yourself? You, you think too highly of yourself. Well, what do you think this is? And I realized like, wait, my confidence triggers people's insecurity because I've had to go through things that most people haven't gone through. So I believe in myself more than the average person because I know what I can endure. I know my pain tolerance. I know my persistence. But I never projected in a way that can be regarded as arrogant. But regardless, it wasn't until the Stanford brand kind of got came on to you that all of a sudden people go, they had something that they could point at that, yeah, that, you know, they could rationalize why you're yeah. different. Yeah, it was, but it was a negative thing in my regard. It was like, oh, you think you're better than us now? You think you deserve more? But I didn't realize that I was getting underpaid. <laughs> I had an, a, a ridiculous amount of responsibility compared to my peers. And then I also had the revelation that the founder of the company I worked for, who paid for my degree, he paid out of pocket with Mr. Jordan. He went to Stanford. So I'm like, if the company was founded there and I went there, why am I now being viewed as somehow a pariah or a disruption to the flow? Because I, I'm, I'm now accredited. And then that's when I, I realized the game that is being played, you know, not only at that company, but in corporate America in general, which is a suppression of self-worth, because the more you feel you need that place for provision, the less likely you are to speak up when you see an injustice, the less likely you are to call things out because you're like, I got to keep my job. I got to take care of my, my, my family. I love every single bit of my journey. The company is not the people. It was the people who felt that way. The company is just, it's a collection of people. I've had more good experiences in this industry than bad, but the ones that stood out was when it made me, once again, right back to when I was a kid, someone making fun of me because of my intelligence and assuming that since I was a designer and I'm supposed to be dumb and just draw pictures. Yeah. You know, you said, you said a phrase I want to come back to for a second. You said the suppression of self-worth. Yeah. How, how do you see that? I, I, I really resonate with that. It reminds me actually, I had Seth Godin on a few months ago yeah. and he said something similar in his book, the song of significance. How, how do you see the suppression of self-worth being manifested in a, in a organizational context? Yeah, so in an organizational context, the suppression of self-worth shows up because of the broken incentive model, right? Like because of moral decoupling, people are seeing very successful outcomes and they don't question how people became successful. It's just like they have more money, they're powerful. Obviously, they're better than us because they have these things. But then when you peel back how they got them, they've stepped over people, they've harmed people, they've been abusive. And so we've separated or bifurcated, which is the word that they said, is that a Stanford word? And I was like, really, bro? That's a word that you know when you read. This has nothing to do with a degree. Um, we bifurcated accountability and leadership from the behaviors by which people exemplify to get to that position of leadership because we just care about the end result. And 
when you see that happening and you see a person who speaks up and then they get hammered or they get pushed out or they get strategically transitioned out of a company by giving them jobs they hate so that they quit, uh, which happens a lot in corporate America. You don't get fired. You just get put in a job you hate. So you resign, right. Right? which is a psychological trick to break your will and teach you don't speak up again. So when you see that happen to a lot of talented people, you start to realize, like, wait, this is a game of this is a game of mental fortitude, chess and understanding that this is a transaction. This is a business. I'm providing a service. They're giving me a fee for that service. This is not an indicator of my life or my worth. This is yeah. uh, this is literally a business transaction in the form of employment. And the moment I realized that the freer I became because I'm like, I can do this transaction in any industry with any company. I don't just have to get valued here. I can go anywhere and get value for my contributions if I continue to up my game. And that freed me from from looking for approval from an organization. Because remember, in society, the only way that we show our value within the hierarchical structure is through the titles we hold. And tribal structure is through the way we dress. It's the endowment. So in modern society, it's our resume. That shows my worth and my hierarchy within my tribe. So if I don't have the big job, the big title, do I really have worth? And then you compound that by the by the narratives that are very, very divisive and hurtful of hyper masculinity, where I not only have to have a big paying job, but I got to be in control. I got to be part Tupac, part Carlton from Fresh Prince. I got to be a gangster that's smart. I got to be this. It's like this weird. I have to be everything and nothing at the same time to be considered a man in America today. And so I stopped subscribing to that mindset. And that's why I label my, 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 my memoir the speed of grace. Did I realize I was moving at the speed of God's grace, not the speed of anybody's, you know, stereotypes or expectations or the market. I made decisions based on, you know, what I believe I was being called to do, even if it didn't make sense to the world. It made sense to me. And that that's been the helpful way that I've navigated. So that's a good uh, now we can come back to your comment you made earlier, deployed by God, not employed by man. Can you talk about the difference between those two uh, orientations towards work? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're not a person of faith, the way that I would describe it, and it's OK, I think people need to realize something. Let me let me let me let me explain something. The faith community right now is going through a crisis because you have a lot of people that say they believe, but then they're the most abusive. Those are not people who believe. Those are false witnesses. Those are the people who do not understand the law of unconditional love and that we're not supposed to be judgmental towards anyone because we already have our own battles to face. So let me let me preface what I'm about to say with that. So. The reason I say deployed versus employed is a very simple concept, ownership versus stewardship. When you are employed by man, you're worried about ownership. What can I can control? What do I get? What do I? But when you understand that this is all entrusted to you by God, then you become a steward of it. What can I do with it? How do I build something that then provides value for people that come after me? How do I keep this thing that I value, you know, pristine and beautiful and, 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 and inclusive? So that mindset shift from employment to deployment took me away from ownership to stewardship because ownership is a function of scarcity mindset. When you grow up in the inner city and you don't have a lot, you're told, hey, man, you, you got to get you got to get it how you live. You got to hold on to it. If you have a lot and you grew up in a, in a nice neighborhood, you're like, I have an expectation to live up to. I have to maintain it. I have to sustain it. So trying to get it and trying to sustain it are equal but opposite reactions to poverty and wealth. And I've seen that when I realized like, wait, some of my friends who grow wealthy, they have way more stress and anxiety than I do because they got to maintain an expectation. Yeah. There's no expectations for me except for the ones I place on myself. So my obstacles, you know, I have to overcome through work ethic. Their obstacles, they have to overcome through, you know, getting that subconscious voice out of their mind that they'll never live up to their mom or dad who is highly successful. And then that's when I realized, like, wait, man, if I let go and I stop telling myself that I own anything and I'm a steward, then I don't I don't covet much. I don't care if things don't work out because I look at it as all part of this fluid experience that's going to lead me to where I'm supposed to ultimately be if I trust it. Yeah. So that's what I've done. I've, I've I just trust the process. So this is this feels like we've kind of culminated perfectly now to your inflection point. And I'd love for you to talk about th those two components that you, that you just recently spoke about. One is stewardship, and then the other is the or the the moral decoupling that takes place in organizations. Yeah. So stewardship decoupling—that's something that folks are resonating with in the chat. I can see. What? How did? How do those two principles or insights have bearing on your decision to do I entrepreneur or intrapreneur? And yeah. Why? And I mean, I think what anybody who's kind of who's probably paying attention is thinking is like, 
why is entrepreneurship even an option to Jason, right? Given, given all that you've said about the kind of moral hazards of organizations. So talk about what is the allure in terms perhaps of stewardship versus what's the danger in terms of decoupling? Yeah. Well, I, I look at it, like I mentioned earlier, I don't believe that, like, I don't fear anybody. I don't fear anything. Like the stuff I've seen in my life, like I do not walk around with scared of any 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 situation. And so, when I think about going back into corporate America, I believe that if I am called to go back into these positions, it's because there's been a dereliction of duty by the leaders that have espoused these ethos to these young people, and they've abused them. They brought them in, built up their hopes, and they squash them. They bring them in, tell them that we need you because you're a consumer, and then they don't listen to their insight. They bring them in, they undervalue their talent, and they overwork them. And so I feel like if we're not going to teach people how to be great leaders by showing what leadership looks like within organized structures, then we almost can guarantee a generation of people that look at us and think like we're heretics, that we're just we're, – we're, 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 we don't believe in what we say we believe. It's do as I say, not as I do. And that's what the generation after us is looking at. You got – you know, public servants who are obviously only doing things for personal gain. You have corporations that are record profits at the same time saying, hey, we're in a recession and things are hard and laying people off the same year that they had, you know, record profits. So you, this generation has more information to discern, like what we say we do and who we are, are two different things. And so I feel like if I am going to be in a position in corporate America, my job isn't to go in and just make product. My job is to go in and, and, and preserve integrity. And show that there are good leaders that still exist because you never know the difference you make in a person's life by being kind, by just simply being kind. Mr. Summers, that's why I love education. If it wasn't for him just saying that, I would not be a person that would stay in the classroom. Like I would have had never thought that education would be for me. But I, I had a great educator that said something to me that changed my life. And I feel like that's what great leaders are. You know, you can you can meet a person at a certain point and say that thing to them. That helps them unlock their full potential and I care about that. So whether or not it's being asked to do the entrepreneurship thing, which a lot of times it just feeds your ego. And it's, you can say you run, you, you run your own company or go into a corporation. It's just more or less like, am I able to serve people in this season of my life in a way that I feel good about, you know, and provide value for my family um, and be able to take care of my parents as they age and be able to take care of the needs of my children as they pursue their dreams and goals. So the decisions I'm making have nothing to do really with if it's a cool resume bullet point. It's more about establishing a sense of, you know, peace and stability for the people that I love and, and that I want to care for. So, so you said, I, I want to key in on one key phrase that you just used. You said, in a way that I feel good about. Mm -hmm. And what I would love to know is, what are you, uh, what are you measuring or, or, or um, what are you aware of, whether you're measuring or not? How... What are you tuning into to know whether you feel good about it? Yeah. Um, well, if I don't feel anxious in my spirit, I know it's something that's meant for me. If I feel like someone's trying to rush me towards a decision or rush me or, or people double back on their word or say they're doing one thing, like those are all red flags for me because I'm like, I really do care about first impressions. And so if it doesn't feel good and it feels like I'm putting more effort into wanting to be part of the thing versus them trying to get me to be part of the thing, then I'm like, yeah, there needs to be a parity in terms of effort. It needs to be parity in terms of, in terms of value creation, but it also needs to be reciprocity in terms of respect. If you're not respected and you don't feel respected from the very first interaction all the way through to employment, then that, that sh you shouldn't tolerate it. You shouldn't tolerate it because people should be valued simply because we're here, not because of any accolades that we hold. Like there's no, line for Stanford grads in heaven. <laughs> like, like you go over here, if you went to the GSB, you go over there, it don't work like that. So we give ourselves these things in society that make us feel more valued. But the basic is, the basic principle for me is, do I feel respected? Do I feel cared for? Do I feel acknowledged? And I've said no to a lot of things. Like I, I have not had a formal, I've been consulting and lecturing, but I've purposefully chosen, you know, over the past 18 months to not take a formal role because I felt a lot of people we're, we're trying to leverage, you know, my insight and my character to make them appear more attractive and make them appear more credible to recruit talent that will believe that there's good leadership when there wasn't. Right. Um, and I peeped that game and I'm like, wow, I have to be really careful about who I allow 
to benefit from the power that I've been given by God, by the mm -hmm. reputation that I've built. Because a lot of times, you know, a lot of organizations, it's optical. They want to they want to borrow a person's power when they bring them in to make it look like they're actually solving their internal problems when they're not. Right. And so I've been very, very hyper aware of not caring about what they offer, the money, the power, but what problem are you bringing me in to solve? Because if the problem is that you don't really care to help people and you just want a person that is on a leadership team that looks like they care, then I don't want to be a marketing tactic. Right. I don't want to. If you really want to do the change, you really want to build an organization that matters, the things that we learned in grad school, then you want to bring me in to help start from the ground up, serving the least of these. From the janitor to the CEO, they all need to feel loved and appreciated. Because that's the style of leadership that I carry. I, I'm an enlightened leader, not a servant leader. Servant leadership has been beaten into the ground and people assume it's this weak, meek leader who just doesn't know how to make a decision. I'm an enlightened leader. I have the data and I have the courage to make tough calls and to hold people accountable. Even if that means that I may lose my job by doing the right thing, I'm willing to do it. Right. Your self-worth is worth more than, than a compromise. Oh, yeah. My soul is worth more than a paycheck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not selling my soul to be accepted by man and be rejected by God. Like, I don't I don't fear approve. I don't seek approval because I know the world will never accept me. It's not meant to accept any of us. That's why it's temporary. We have to accept ourselves. That's the only battle we'll face is the inner me. That's our greatest enemy. So once I accepted that I am my own worst competition, I am my, my best competition. I am my own worst enemy. I am my own bully. Ambition was a trauma response. And it wasn't an intention to become successful. It was outrunning those periods in my life where I felt less than. Then I got into this groove of understanding, like, man, I'm enough, regardless of whatever job I hold, employed, not employed, making money, not making money, doesn't matter. I'm enough. And that, that gives me peace. If I may be so bold in this last few minutes we've got, I feel like that's what you said. My greatest enemy is inner me. Um, what's the last battle you fought? with the inner me yeah and tell us about how you how the how the goliath rose up and how you identified it and how you realized that's a that's a problem yeah so um i think the thing that i would share is overcoming my insecurity with how i look so as a kid like i'm mixed race right like my mom is mixed i told you we found out later in life that my grandfather was was Ashkenazi Jew, and I didn't know what that was. I, you know, I had to learn later on in life. And so, growing up, people would always ask me, "What are you? You know, like, what are you? Why is your hair straight? What, what are you? Like, what, your mom, like, what, what are you?" So I always had like this insecurity over how I looked. So I felt like that at a certain point in my life, I needed to overcome that insecurity by having this 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 level of success that would tell people look I'm valuable now you may not like how I look or like where I, that I, you know I don't know my ethnicity and all the things I'm mixed with but here's this thing that you can look at that is irrefutably beautiful irrefutably brilliant like that's where I got my value from and so I had to stand there literally one day and just stare at myself in the mirror and be like man I accept every bit of me every bit of me I accept it this is who I am this is what God has given me I am grateful for it and I'm not going to let this be the subconscious thing in the back of my mind that justifies when things go wrong. Like, of course it goes wrong. You know, think about it. You're 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 an enigma to it. I will always justify bad things by saying, of course, I deserve it because because you know, of how I grew up or where I came from. So I, I had to overcome that, you know, you're, you know, through therapy, through prayer, through, you know, writing my book. It helped me to release all those thoughts that didn't serve me and serve my highest good when I was able to to see it, because you can't conquer what you don't confront and we very seldomly confront ourselves because most people don't want to look in the mirror because they don't like what they see yeah so i i stared in the mirror like i said i run up to goliath after i killed them and cut the head off because i wasn't afraid of the challenge just like i wasn't afraid of looking at myself and saying all right it's me it's me that's the limiting factor in my life there's no external thing stopping me from being anything i want to be i don't believe in that i believe i'm unlimited because my god is unlimited so why would i place limits on something that is unlimited and that broke me free by realizing like i don't have to have low expectations of myself if anything i gotta have higher expectations of god yeah <laughs> that's it yeah you said something to me that i told you before we started recording or before we went live that i you know i i mentioned at a kind of key juncture in my life a few years ago you uh you reminded me that all everything comes from god and part of our challenge and part of my inner me is 
thinking that, you know, I've got, that it's all, it, it all rests on me. It all depends on me. And so um, I can attest, you know, as, as someone who's, who's benefited from your leadership and example, that you're, uh, you're battling these battles for yourself is a blessing and, and uh, uplifting for the rest of us. So thank you so much. All good, man. This is part of the journey. You know, we got to share these stories because, you know, success, um, it doesn't look like what people think it looks like. Neither does failure. And both are beautiful. When you embrace it, it's just part of your narrative, man. So that's it. That's my journey. Yeah, it's beautiful. We're excited to see where you land. We're excited to keep following the, uh, the uh, if, you might, if you may, I thought of the uh, chili ad. <laughs> sure. I, don't know, I don't know if that's exactly it, but like the ongoing saga of the chili ad is, is, uh, is yet to uh, wrap, but we're excited to watch as the journey unfolds. We're grateful for your leadership and example. Thanks so much for joining us today, Jason. Thank you, brother, for having me, man. Appreciate y'all for tapping in. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Until then, be good.